You are now listening to the RNS Seek tutorial. I'm Berenice Batu. I'm a postdoc researcher at, from the Freiburg Galaxy team at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Before you have listened to the transcriptomic lecture from Fotis, and now we will apply what you learned during these lectures to RNS Seek data, and yeah, we will apply that to real data. And for that, we will use the European Galaxy server that you can reach at usegalaxy.eu. You should have learned before uh, when following one of the Galaxy introduction tutorials how to log in, so please log in to this uh, server um, and then we will follow the tutorials. So the tutorials you can find that on the training uh, on the Galaxy training uh, materials. So you can open a new tab and type training.galaxyproject.org. You will be redirected to this page where you have all the tutorials listed. You go to transcriptomics and then you go to the reference based RNA-seq data analysis. You will have these tutorials. Um, as you may have already seen it, you can also uh, I have the tutorial directly visible into Galaxy. So to do that, you click on this small hat on the top, which is Seek Galaxy Training Materials. You click there, and then you go. You are redirected to the Galaxy Training page, and then you go to Transcriptomics, and you search for the reference-based RNA-seq data analysis tutorials. You click there, and the tutorials will be open. And it's the tutorial we will follow now. So, and with these tutorials, we will try to answer the different questions, like what are the different steps to process RNA-seq data? How to identify differentially expressed genes across multiple experimental ex conditions? What are the biological functions impacted by the differential expression of genes? And at the end of this tutorial, you should be able to do several things. You should be able to check a sequence quality report generated by FASTQC for RNA-seq data. You should be able to explain the principle and specificity of mapping of RNA-seq data to an eukaryotic reference genome. You should be able to select and run a state-of-the-art mapping tools for RNA-seq data, evaluate the quality of mapping results, but also describe the process to estimate the library soundness, estimate the number of reads per genes. Explain how, to con how, how the cunt normalization is done to perform, to perform before sample comparisons. Construct and run a differential uh, gene expression analysis. Analyze DSEC output to identify, annotate, and visualize uh, differentially expressed genes. But also perform a gene ontology enrichment analysis and uh, perform and visualize an enrichment analysis for cake pathway. You probably, most of the terms that you heard before, you may never heard before. And, but it's not, it's not um, everything is fine. We will, you will learn that by following these tutorials. Before this tutorial, you should have gone uh, through at least one of the Galaxy introduction tutorials and also followed at least uh, the quality control and mapping tutorials. You can find the links onto this tutorial there and follow this tutorial. Um, as Fortis did for the introductions, um, with the lecture introductions, RNA-seq has become a widely used technologies to analyze uh, the continuous changing cellular transcriptome. It's one, one of the most common and aim of RNA-seq is to identify gene is to profile the gene expression and identify genes and molecular pathways that are differentially expressed between different conditions. And it's what we will do now in these tutorials. We will try to identify differentially expressed genes and pathway from real data. And for that, we will use the data that has been published in 2011. And in this, in this um, study, the authors wanted to identify genes and pathway that are regulated by the depletion by a bacillar genes. So what they did, they deleted the bacillar genes in some drosophila by RNA interference, and they extracted the total RNA and to prepare and prepare uh, single N and parent uh, RNA seq libraries for the samples that are where uh, RNA uh, where the bacillus gene have been depleted, but also for some samples where from control samples where nothing happened. 
This library were then sequenced to obtain RNA secrets for each samples. You can find the old data uh, available. The old data are available in, in CBI. You can find the detail there. But for this tutorial and to learn how to, run, to analyze this data, we will use only seven of the samples. Four that are that we can call control samples or untreated samples, and three treated samples where the Pacilla genes has been depleted. So each sample constitu constitutes a separate biological replicate. Um, but for for some of the sample, some of the sample has been sequenced using parent sequencing, and some were sequenced using single end. And we will learn how to manage both of this this different type of sequencing. So through this tutorial, we will deal through a normal RNA seq uh, data analysis pipeline. So we will do a quality control mapping, counting the, the number of reads per annotated genes, run a differential expression analysis, um, visualize it, and run a functional arrangement analysis. We now need to have the data into Galaxy. Um, for the first part of this tutorial, we will use uh, the files for two out of the seven samples to demonstrate the first steps of the, of the pipeline. Um, the data, so for to getting the data into Galaxy, we need first to create a new history. So we are now in the tutorials, we want to go back to Galaxy interface, so we click outside of the tutorials here, anywhere. We need to create a new history, so you go on the history panel on the right, you click on create a new history. We rename the history, rename it rna -seq tutorial, and then we need to get data into, we need to get to add our data there in this history. If you go back to the tutorials, you will see that uh, you can import a uh, FASTQ file uh, for the different, for these two samples from Zenodo, where they are stored, by copy uh, the different links that are, li that are there and import them. Um, if you don't know how to do that, you can expand this uh, little box and you will, uh, you, it will be explained. But if you are using the European Galaxy server, we already put the data on the shared data libraries for you. So uh, we will do that. We will import the data using the data libraries. So to do that, go back to Galaxy. You will go on the top to shared data. You click on data libraries. You will be redirected to a new page where you have different folders. You may have different folder than my, mine, but you should have all the same that is called GTN materials. You click on GTN materials, it's uh, the, the materials from all the training materials tutorials. Um, you go then to in transcriptomics, uh, you go to the reference-based rna -seq data analysis, you click on DOI, uh, the title, the, and then you we got different, uh, we got different files. You have just some GTF file that we will use later. And then you have for, for different um, for the different samples um, that are named GSM uh, 4611 something. You have different files. So you have a FASCU Sanger, you have a CONTS, etc. for each of the samples. Um, we need to go back to the tutorial to check which samples we want to use. Uh, so please, you can select there. Uh, you see that you are redirected to the home page because we changed the page so it's not loaded anymore. So we go to transcriptomics. Again, the reference page, uh, rna data analysis tutorials. Um, you can go directly to the correct sections if you go on the left in the, in the table of content. And you see that for this uh, for these tutorials, we need to load the 77 sample, that is a control, a untreated sample, and the 80, that is a treated sample. So we will select the file, the FASTQ file for these samples. And as it's mentioned here, it should be 77 underscore 1, 77 underscore 2, 80 underscore 1, 80 underscore 2. So we need to select four files there. So we select 77 underscore 1, 77 underscore 2. 
Um, and then we need to go on the second page and to find the AT underscore one, AT underscore two. So you should have selected four uh, data sets and that we want to Im export to our history as a data set. Then you select in which history you want to import them and you click on import. It will import the select items into your history. When it's um, green here, you can go back to the main, uh, the main page of Galaxy by clicking on Analyze Data. And then on the right, in your history, you should have now four datasets. But you see that the names of these datasets are the URL names, so we need to rename them. So to, we need to edit attributes and then we remove the first part of the URL to keep only 77 underscore 1. We save that and we do that for the other data sets here. Underscore 7. Save that. We now go to 80. We do the same. We do that again for the last data set. Perfect. And we now have four files with a better naming. But we want to be sure that these both data sets are from, from the same sample. So 77 underscore 1 and 77 underscore 2 are somehow linked together. We want to add something that is called a tag. So to do that, we expand the data sets by clicking on it and we click edit data set tag. And we add a tag, which is the name of the sample. So GSM 46, 11, 70. 77. And we want to be sure that this tag propagates, that it's visible uh, for each uh, other outputs for, um, for this, the tool that are run for that. So we add a hashtag first. We copy this, uh, this um, tag that has been added because we want to add the same tag to the other samples. So you do that and once you are ready you can click on the return a, a key on your keyboard. You do the same for the same end, and then you pass the, the tag that you already added. Then it's automatically added there. You see that now we have be below the names of the of the files you have a small tag there. And you will see later how it can be really useful. Then we add the same for the other one GSM 46 11 80. You copy it also because you will add it again to the other file that I set here. And here we are. So we now have four files with the correct naming in our history and with the tags. Check again on the tutorials. Did we forget any steps? So we need to reload. I'm sorry, the tutorial. So we go to transcriptomic, reference based, RNS data analysis data upload. We are in this step. So we created a new history that we named correctly. We imported the FASTQ file. We renamed each data set according to the sample. Ah, we forgot this step. Check the data type if the data type is FASTQ singer and not FASTQ. So to do that, we expand the file. We see that FASTQ singer is there. FASTQ singer, FASTQ singer, FASTQ singer. So all good for with our data sets. Let's go back to the tutorial. Um, and then we added a tag for all the, 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 the sample name. And then we have a question. How are the data, the data sequence stored and what are the different entries in the file? So if we open one of the file, we see that we have a FASTQ, FASTQ file, which means that each sequence is stored as a four lines. Uh, the first line is always starting is always starting with the hat, then the sequence ID and then some some information from the sequencing uh, from the sequencing facility. Then the first the second line is the sequence itself. Uh, the third line starts with the plus, and the fourth line is a sequence uh, of quality for each nucleotide. So this is the quality score, the I for the T. Um, but if you already, you should have already followed the quality control tutorials where 
everything is already detailed there. So I will not go through the details there now about that. So uh, let's go back to the tutorial so we finish that. Files that we just uploaded to Galaxy contain the reads that are raw data from the sequencing machine. So no pretreatment has been done uh, on the data. So the first step that we need to do for any RNA-seq analysis is to assess the quality. Because during sequencing, some errors can be introduced, such as incorrect nucleotide being called. And they are due to technical limitation of the sequencing platforms. Um, but you probably already know more from the quality control tutorials. And so now we will follow the same step that you did during the quality control tutorials. We will run FastQC to create a report of the quality, sequence quality. We will run MultiQC to aggregate the generated report and could adapt to improve the quality of sequence via trimming and filtering. So let's go back to Galaxy. So first we need to run FastQC. So we go back to Galaxy. We search on the toolbar on the left. We search for FastQC. And then we select FastQC read quality report. Um, then we need to we want to run that on all our force files. So we click on multiple data sets, and with the shift uh, key on your keyboard, you select the four files there, and then you can execute. And you will see that in your history, um, for each of the samples, two uh, new data sets are generated. So FastQC on the data one uh, web page and FastQC on the data one, for example, raw data there. And what we want to do afterwards is to aggregate the FastQC, FastQC report uh, using MultiQC. So we can start, we can already launch MultiQC, even if FastQC is not run, is already running, is still running. Um, so we search for MultiQC in the toolbar. We select uh, on which file, in which uh, tools has been used to generate the report. So we search for FastQC, FastQC. Um, then we need to say which type of FastQC output we will use the raw data, and then using again the shift uh, again now the command or the uh, keyboard you can select the different the raw data that you need to have. So the four you should have select four files so file raw data and then you can execute. So MultiQC will wait until FastQC all FastQC are done to run. Um, so we have a few minutes now to, to wait um, and you see already that the, the tag that we added there are automatically added to the, to the FastQC. So it's a way for us to keep track of which, so that this FastQC has been run on, on data one, which is this one, which means this sample here. So it's a better way for us to, to keep track of that. So if we open, for example, the FastQC report web page for the data one, you see that you have some basic information, basic statistics, and uh, some reports that has been generated. But you already go through each of these reports by following the quality control tutorials. Um, so I just check on the tutorial. So we are in the end zone uh, quality control. So we see that FastQC, we run FastQC. And it's, we have a question there. What is the rate length? So how do we know the rate length? So we open the web page uh, report from FastQC. And we see that the length, uh, sequence length is 37. So it's quite small sequences there. But it's also, remember, it's all data from 2000 that has been published in 2011. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, we go back to the tutorial here. Um, we see that we are already running MultiQC. And then once MultiQC is done, we need to inspect the web page output for MultiQC. And we have two questions to check then. What do you think about the quality of the sequence? What should we do? Um, so MultiQC is, we are waiting for MultiQC to run. And if you see already that because we run MultiQC on the output of these files that have these different tags, we see that the, the both tags has been added there for this file. 
So MultiQC is running. We are waiting until MultiQC is done. And should should be fast now. And once it's done, we will open it. So it's green. Everything is fine. We can open it. And you see that the different uh, report for the different for the different uh, samples has been uh, aggregated together, and we can go through the different uh, output from FastQC, and we see the different uh, the different sample in one in one in one report. So one graphs for for the sequence quality histogram, and with the different sample there. So the question was, oops, sorry again. Um, so what do you think about the quality of the sequence? Um, so the quality is quite good. So it's mostly for most of the sample it's green. So the quality is okay. It's decreasing at the end, which is expected for most of the Illumina sequencing. But we see that one of the sample, the AT underscore two, um, is the, the decrease is much higher, so it's much more important, and it's uh, labeled as orange by FastQC. So maybe the quality is not so good there. Um, I'm sorry, I will be used to that again. So what should we do? Um, so here you have a more detailed answers if you want to check. Um, so the quality, the the histogram of the mean quality score per sequence is quite okay, except for AT underscore two. Um, we see that here we may need to trim the end of the sequence because the, it's dropping too much. Uh, the GC content is okay. Um, there is some some end content, so some some nucleotide that are ends. We have a quite uh, duplication level, quite high, but it's expected for RNA-seq data. And I think that's most of the things. Um, yep. But if you want more details about the, what we can say about that, you, I recommend you to check the, the, the detailed answer that you have there. But we have... Uh, so. As we said, we should trim the read to get rid of the bases that were sequenced with ice identity, so it means mo mostly the end of the reads. And also remove the reads with the overall bad quality. We have another question in the tutorials. What is the relationship between uh, underscore 1 and underscore 2 for each of the samples? Um, we are talking here about uh, parent sequencing. So the underscore one is the river, the forward reads, and the a underscore two are the reverse reads. And you have a detailed explanation there about what does that mean. So now we need to, we want to remove the the bad quality uh, nucleotide, but also the reads. So for that we will need to run cutadapt. So we need go to the tools we search for cut adapt here remove reuse that um, we have as we mentioned because we checked that we have underscore two underscore one we have parent data so we said parent and then we need to select uh, as the the dash one so that it's the forward reads with the underscore one um, the underscore two, uh, then as the reverse, um, what are the different? So we need to check. I don't remember all the details. So we want to have a filtering option. So remove all the reads that are that have um, that are shorter than twenty. We want to to get rid of the reads where the quality, the the mean quality, is below twenty. Um, but also uh, in the um, if the quality drop too much, so we go back. Sorry to again. So in filtering options, so we need to go down filter options here. We want to have a minimum length of twenty. In read modification option, we want a quality cutoff of 20. That we mean that uh, that the the quality base 
it will trim the quality base uh, for that um, there uh, on, based on the quality score of 20 and in the output uh, output options we want a report to be yes so output options we want to create a report that can be used afterwards for multi QC Globally, I recommend you to go through all the parameters to check that, but here I go quickly, uh, you can see more details uh, during the, the, with the quality control tutorials, but also by reading the, through the documentation. So we generate a report that we can again uh, aggregate using multi-QC. So I recommend while Catadapt is running to also already start multi-QC. So then um, for multi-QC, which tool has been used, you select, you search for Cutadapt uh, and then you need to select the both uh, the report and you have two reports that has been generated. Because, um, so now we don't have four, uh, four Cutadapt that have been run, but only two, because we all used already the, the do two samples together. So we have two reports that we need to aggregate using MultiQC. You can take a short break now because Cutadapts can take some time to run. It is now finished and as well as MultiQC. So we can inspect the MultiQC output to check the result of the, of the, of the trimming and the cutting of the removing of the data sets. So, if we see that, if we open the multi-QC, we see that for the 77 samples, 2.5% uh, of the base pair has been trimmed. So especially at the end of the of, um, at the end of the reads, and for the 80 samples, it seems that 12% have been removed. It's something we expected given the result, and when we saw that for a for at least for the for the 80 uh, samples, the quality was not so good at the end. Um, and we can see also, if we look at the percentage of filter reads, uh, we see that uh, quite a lot of, of reads has been removed also. Um, so for the 77 of, uh, sample, 1.3 uh, 1.4 percent of the read were too short after the cutting, so they were removed. Um, and for the 80 sample, 9 percent has been removed. So it's mean that uh, so a lot of, of the base pairs has, re, has been cut out of the end of the read, and then the read will become too small to be kept, too short to be kept. So it's what it said there. So if we go back to the tutorials, um, there were uh, these questions uh, were exactly were asked then in the tutorials. So now we can move to the mapping part. Now that the quality control is done, we need to do a mapping. So the mapping, the idea of the mapping is to make sense of the read, to try to identify where these uh, reads come from, from which gene they come from. Um, once we are, so we need, for that we need to locate where, the, where they come from on the genomes to then associate, okay, this part of the genome where they belongs to is part of, is, uh, this part of the genomes where they belongs um, correspond to these genes. So when we, because uh, we are talking about Drosophila, and for Drosophila there is a reference genome available, so we can use that to help us uh, finding the locations. This process is called is called aligning or mapping the reach to the reference genome. Um, you should have already learned a bit about mapping by following the the tutorials on mapping. If not, please feel free to feel please follow it. So in this study, uh, so we used uh, Drosophila melanogaster cells to, to extract the, the RNA. So we need to use the same. Uh, we need to use to find the reference genome of Drosophila, to map then the sequence to that. Um, there is a question uh, on the tutorials about what is a reference genome, um, what are the different versions of a reference genome, why do we have that, um, and which reference genome we should use. 
um, please check the solutions on your own. But the answer is we need to use the reference genome uh, once we start using a reference genome. We, and we, which one version of the reference genome you we should keep using this one along. So uh, when we talk about a chaotic transcriptor, uh, most read origin that uh, origin from from mRNA, so from uh, uh, messenger RNA, so from genes like the introns. So the reads come from exon one, exon two, or exon three, and they can they can somehow what we call uh, span over these different exons. For example, the blue year. These blue reads um, span over exon 1 and exon 2 and miss the uh, intro in between exon 1 and exon 2. So then, uh, because of that, because of the specificity of eukaryotic uh, transcriptome, um, we cannot just map the read to the genome as we usually do for our DNA data. We need some specific mappers that, um, that are developed to, to efficiently map uh, the reads to to different exon. So most of the idea of most of the the idea of most of these um, mappers of these tools um, is they try to map the reads over the different exons. So like this, so they map this read to this exon one and this one. So we call them the mapped reads. And once um, out of the read that didn't map, they try to split them over different exons. So it's the idea of uh, splicing aware mappers, and it's what um, and it's used for transcriptomic and eukaryotic transcriptomic data. Um, we gave here in this box uh, more details about the different uh, spliced aware um, mappers. Um, and especially the history behind them. I uh, recommend you to read that. I will not go through the detail now, but just to remember there are different generations of mappers and with different uh, um, implementation there. So now we will read, we will map our reads to the Drosophila melanogaster uh, genome, reference genome, using a tool that is called STAR. For that, we need to have first uh, um, annotations of where the different exons are in the genomes. We need to import that into our history. Um, as for the data, there is uh, this file, it's, which is called a GTF file, is available in the data library, so we'll import it. So please go back to Galaxy, go to shared data, data libraries. You go then to the GTN material, once you are there, you search for transcriptomic. You go to the reference-based RNA-seq data analysis, uh, then the DOI, and then you use the, this one. So the third file here, oops, sorry, we want to import it to history. Yeah, we want to import in our history. So it's here to be sure that we use the same file, um, but just for to be sure, so if you go to Galaxy and in the data library, so if you go back to share data data libraries, you can see that you, there is other uh, genomes and annotation available there, um, where you can find the annotation, the reference genome, etc. Here we will use this one because uh, to be sure that we all use the same, um, between different uh, Galaxy uh, server, but here I just showed you where you can find other reference genomes on your European Galaxy server. So let's go back to Galaxy. Um, and then, so we have now our GTF file uh, there. We will rename it as we did for the FASTQ file at the beginning. So we remove the first part, we remove .gtf at the end, and we save it. Uh, and I think, oh, we need to load again the tutorials as every time we change a page on the interface. So we go back there, we were in the mapping part and we are here now. So we need to rename the history. We need to check that the GTF, the data type is GTF and not GFF and that the database is DM6 which is the version of Drosophila melanogaster. So the GTF, oh, which one we need to already? We need to be sure that 
it's GTF, the data type, and the database is DM6. So we have the GTF here, we need to change now the database, so we go to edit attribute, and then here in database build, you can search for DM6 here, and you save it. So now um, it's to be sure that, uh, that this file is associated with that. Okay, so now we want to run um, a RNA star, which is a mapper, with the following parameters to map the read to the reference genome. So we want to use parent data set, so we search for star in the tools, um, and you use the RNA star, gap read mappers for RNA data. We say that we have parent uh, data as individual data sets. Um, we now need to use, so now we need to put the forward reads and the reverse read here. We have two samples, so we need to collect, to, to run, and we want to run the same parameters, so we need to select multiple data sets. We need to select now the output of cutadapt, cut that were the trimmed reads. So for the forward, it's always the read one, output and for the reverse the read two. Be careful when you select them so it's important that you select the correct one. Custom or built-in reference genome so we need to use a, a built-in reference built-in um, we want to use uh, what is again so we want to use genome reference with without built-in genome so without we select the reference genome which is dm6 um, then we can give a gene model for the splice junction, so it means where are the different exons, so for that we can use the GTF file that we just uploaded. Then there is the length of the genomic sequencing around the annotated junctions, and it says the ideal value is read length minus 1. Uh, do you remember what were the lengths? Uh, we thought that in the output of FASTQC, so it was 37, so here we need to put 36. Um, then, what are the different parameters? And so 36, and that's all. So you can check the other outputs, but yeah, take time when you have the time to do that. I will not do it now. So then you can execute uh, star. It can take, it will take some time. So please uh, feel free to take a break now for a few minutes, just the time it's running. RNA star is now done, so you have now in your history, you have uh, three files for the 80 sample and three files for 77. Um, as we did for FASTQC or for CATADAPT, we can aggregate the results from star and the report that are there in logs using MultiQC, so search for MultiQC. In the tools, you search for star are the tools that have been used for generate. Uh, we use the log and you select the to log file there and you can execute that. Um, it will give you give us some some informations like which um, how many how many reads uh, has been mapped to the reference genomes, uh, how many read has been multiple mapped, so it's meaning to several locations uh, in, in, the, in the reference genome, etc. And so once while MultiQC is running, we can check, so we have a question afterwards, so what percentage of read has been mapped exactly have been like exactly once for both samples and what are the other available statistics and so you have some details here so we will check the results once MultiQC is done and it seems to be done now so I will open the web page so it say that um, uh, 80 per 83 percent of the read for the first data set has been mapped or aligned to the reference genome 79 for the second uh, refer gene for the second data sets if you will look at the percentage so 80 80.3 has been uniquely mapped so it's mean that they are mapped to only one locations and then we have 
5.5% of the read that has been mapped to multiple locations. It means probably that the reads are too short and because of some repetitions we can see that. And some has been mapped to too many locations in the same times and some were too short to be correctly mapped. And we have also the information for the, for the second data set here. Oops, sorry, here. So we go back here. Um, so it means, so according to the report, uh, more than 80% of the read uh, for both samples has been mapped at least once for to the reference genomes. So we can then proceed with the analysis. Um, if the percentage were below 70%, we should probably investigate for possible contaminations. It can be due during the sequencing, during the RNA extraction or something. Um, one thing you can do then is trying to, if you have such a case, uh, you can try to map to the human reference genome or to other reference genome or maybe bacteria to see if you have uh, some possible contamination that you can remove them. Um, but the main output of and the more interesting output for, for RNA star is the BAM file. Um, but if you follow already the, RNA, the mapping tutorials, you already know what is a BAM file and that which information you have in a BAM file. So I will not go too much in details. I will just try to find some example here. So here, so if you scroll down after the, the, the first line of um, comments, you have the name of the sequence and some extra informations like the, the size and on which chromosome it has been mapped, on which locations, with the quality, etc., etc. But you find the detail, um, you can find the detail here on, on the mapping here, on how, how it looks like. Um, so the question is which information do you find in a BAM file, in a SAM file, and what are the different information compared to the FASTQ file? So the more information that you, the, the BAM file and FAST SAM file compared to a FASTQ file is that you have the location of the read or where the read has been mapped on the reference genome. The BAM file contain as BAM file contains information for all our reads. It makes it difficult to inspect and explore, especially with this format, the text format. So there is powerful tool now to visualize the content of a BAM file. Uh, for example, using IGV. So I recommend you to install IGV um, and start it. So I already started locally for me. So feel free, please start it. Uh, check, follow the instruction to install it. And then we can visualize the BAM file uh, for the 77 sample together. So uh, we go back to Galaxy. You, we already started uh, the, BAM, the IGV, so you expand, you go to the BAM file here. And what you can do, you can say display with IGV local. And then it will uh, launch IGV for you. And then you can see here the different uh, information here. We will zoom in a bit, so to zoom you select Arabia there and you can see there, you need to see to zoom again a bit more, again. Oh, we don't see anything. You have here, okay now it's a zoom out a bit, so here. No, oh. it's loading slowly. So IGV is a quite uh, slow tool, um, but yeah, it's a good one. So here you have an, a good example. So here you have uh, the different reads here and where they are mapped on the reference genome that is on the top, you see their locations. Um, and you have what we call the courage here, which is only that represents the density of read mapping to, to the different locations here. If we go back to the tutorials uh, on Galaxy, sorry, I need to close that. Um, if we go back to the to the to the tutorials, we would like to zoom to the specific location, so on the chromosome chromosome four. So please copy this log the the um, the this text here, so chromosome four, etc., and go back to the, your IGV. And what you do, you can pass this location here on the top, here, 
and it will go directly to the specific region that is there. So you can see exactly the region that we want to, sh to display um, within IGV with, uh, that is from the tutorial. So if we go back to the tutorial, we should have something like this. Um, what, is, what is the information appear on the top of the gray peaks? So that this one is the coverage, as we already mentioned. What do the connecting lines between the sum of the align read indicate? So if we go back to IGV here, you have some example here of his lines, the horizontal lines between, re, between some, between there. Um, these are the spanning, um, the introns in between. So you have a read that mapped here, one part of the read here and one part here. So it's mean that this read is spanning over this intron that is there. It's what is represented by that. Uh, what another way to inspect the splicing junction is what is using what is called a sashimi plot. So to do that, to create a sashimi plot, what you can do is right click on IGV and click on sashimi plot here. So it will create this, uh, this sashimi plot here, where you have the coverage here, and then in this location here, you have this arc here with some number on the top here. It's the number of reads that's spanning over this intro. So here we have seven reads that mapped or, and span over this specific intro. 30 year, 20 year, 22, etc. It's what is represented here. Um, and the next question is what, what do we why do we observe different stacked group of line blue lines here on the bottoms? Um, these are the diff, the represent the different transcripts of the gene um, that are represented in the in the in the um, in the GTF file, so in the annotated file, we see that, so we know that there is an exon here and some, uh, e some intron here and exon here, but we know that um, they can be used by different genes. So this one is one gene, this one in another gene, etc. So we have different uh, gene name here that use the same exon for in the annotation. Okay. Um, and uh, once you did that, once you are done with the inspection of the mapping result, you can do some extra checking about for the mapping. We gave a lot of details in this uh, expandable box here uh, to check, for example, uh, the percentage of duplicate reads using a tool that is called Mark Duplicate, the number of reads mapped to each chromosome, the body coverage, um, the read uh, distribution across features, so across genes, across intron, exon, etc. Um, we will not go through that. I recommend you to do it on your own and to apply that also to your own data set then later. So we now have the, used the mapping. We have now the information of where the reads are located in the reference genome and how well they were mapped. And so the next step in our RNA-seq data analysis is quantify to quantify uh, the number of reads mapped to a specific genomic feature, so the genes. Back now to identify the genes that are differentially expressed because of the Bacilli genes no, um, depletions. So for that, we need to uh, we now so we have where the the reads are mapped, but on the locations they are mapped on the genomes, but not to which genes they correspond to. So to then compare the expression of sequences between different conditions, so between uh, with depletion or without depletions, we need to, to identify the number of reads that are, um, we need to quantify the number of reads per genes. Or specifically, we need to, to quantify the number of read mapping to the exon of each genes. As we already mentioned before, so the reads are mapping only to exon, not the intron. So when we need to count, uh, to count the number of reads per genes, we need to count the number of reads that are mapping over the exons. So um, if we take this example of these figures, um, the question, so we have two questions here. So how many reads are found for the different exons? So for example, for the exon 1, we have three, three reads mapping there. Exon 2, 2. Exon 1 in the second genes, 1, 2, 3. Exon 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. And exon 3, 1, 2, 3. 
But then if we count the, at the level of the genes, uh, we have different numbers. So we, it's not just an addition of, of the number of thread mapping for the different exons. We need to take into account this case of the thread that map uh, that span over two exons. So here for this, uh, this, this gene, so gene 1, we have 1, 2, 3, 4 reads that, that um, map to the genes and not uh, five if we would have just add, uh, make an addition between the two. And here for the gene two, it's the same because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and not one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So we need to be careful when we do the counting of just not uh, to count the different reads inside the genes by. Uh, taking into account the exon and the, the, the reads that span over the different exons. So different tools are available for that, HD second or features count. Um, we will use today features count because it's, uh, it's currently faster and requires far less uh, computational resources um, to do that. So uh, in principle, this accounting uh, was um, it's a fairly simple task, as I mentioned, but there is some detail that needs to be given to features count. Uh, for example, the strandness. So, um, and because uh, the RNA seq uh, RNA are typically targeting a single, single uh, strand and have polarity, um, the strandness is usually lost after both strands of cDNA are sensitized and selected. Um, however, keeping this information can be useful, uh, especially for a read located on the overlap between two genes. So, for example, if you have the read one here, you are, and it's map here, you are quite sure that it's mapping and it's belonging to read one, to gene one. But if you, we talk about the read two here, that mapped here at the overlap between read gene one and gene two, gene one being on one on one strand of the DNA and gene two on the other other strand, um, you, we don't know to which one, uh, to which genes read 2 belongs to. And some library preparation protocol uh, uh, creates some what is called a stranded RNA seq library, and, and by extracting only the RNA map uh, belonging to, one, uh, to the genes from one strand. So we need to do have this information. So if our library preparation is unstranded or stranded, and on which strand it belongs to. Um, if you want to know more about strandness, you can read more. Uh, we, we added much more information here about the strandness information. Uh, usually this information is provided with your FASQ file with when you got your FASQ file from your sequencing facility. If not, you need to try to find on the site um, where you donated the data or in the corresponding publication this information. It usually comes with the library preparation. But if if you have no way that you find this information, what you can do, you can use a tool that is called Infer Experiment from R RSEC QC tool suite. Uh, this tool takes a BAM file from the mapping and select a subsample of the reads and compare the, their, uh, where these reads are mapping to the coordinates uh, and strengths of, of um, using the annotations. So based on the strand of the genes where we can find the read, we can um, estimate uh, whether the sequencing uh, protocol is strand specific or not. So, for example, if we know that all the the genes are mapping to only gene, it's all the read are mapping only to genes belonging to the forward read. We know that it's a stranded library forward. Same for reverse. And if we are read uh, that mapped on both on statistically on every genes on the genomes, then we can estimate that the library is unstranded. So. Here, we will assume that we don't know the library st uh, strainness, so we need to, to estimate that. So we need first to convert the GTF, uh, the annotation file, to a bed 12, because it's needed to the tool infer experiment. So, the first step that we need to do, so uh, we need to do a convert GTF to BED. 
So it will take this uh, our Drosophila melanogaster uh, annotation file and, um, and transfer transform it into a bed file, a bed twelve file. Um, yep. Here, execute. So the bed twelve is a just another. It's also a tabular file. It's a different way of uh, different column order than the GTF. And then once you have that, we will use a tool that is called infer experiment. Infer experiment. Um, that speculate how our RNA seq were configured. So we need to provide the BAM file. Uh, so we provide the both BAM file. We will provide the reference genome um, that is in bed 12 here. Uh, we need to select how many uh, reads uh, sample from the BAM file to use. Uh, so here there is 200,000. Uh, we will use the same number. So 200,000, the mapping quality, minimum mapping quality of 30. So just for information, the mapping quality uh, is encoding the same way as the nucleotide quality for sequencing is. So between 0 and 40 around. So here we keep a quite high, level, high threshold. Um, then it will generate two files, so two, two outputs for the infer experiments that are from the both uh, sample here. Um, and uh, the, this tool generates one file with, which, is a, which is a text file with uh, information if the, lab, the library is parent or single end and the fraction of read that were failed to, for which we don't know if they become to, to one strand on the others um, or map to a specific genes on trend. And then for the different type of library, they will say how many reads are mapping um, uh, the fraction of read that can be explained because mapping to the to forward strand uh, genes, the fraction for the reverse strand reads. So, if we open uh, the this one uh, that is from for the AT sample, here we can see. So this is parent data. The fraction of read that we have failed to determine is uh, nine percent. The fraction of read explained by 1 plus plus 1 minus blah 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 etc. is 0 0.35. So it's meaning that 45% uh, of the read are somehow mapped to the to the forward and 45 to the reverse read. To the reverse trend. So then here, because the fraction is I mean, we don't. Uh, it seems that there is no clear uh, distinctions between the the, the 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 two types. So we can uh, we cannot say we have to say that this uh, the library seems to be unstranded. Um, if you want more details about the strandness and the because it can be sometimes difficult to find out which settings correspond to to the to the others given when we talk about the strainness, um, we created a small table that can be useful to identify the library type that you need to fill or the information that you need to fill for the different tools. So depending on the library preparation and the tool here, um, what are the different, so if it's parent and um, and uh, and um, forward or reverse, etc., etc. So now we know that um, our reads are for uh, and you know, our library preparation unstranded. We can run uh, feature scans to count the number of reads per annotated genes. So we search for feature counts here in our tools. So feature feature counts. We define we need to give our two BAM file. Um, we say that its uh, library is unstranded. We will use um, a locally cached uh, annotation file. We will. Oop. Ah, in your history, sorry. The annotation is in our history. We'll use the GTF file. We want the output to be a gene ID 
slash read cons that can be used for multi QC and DSEC2. We want to create a, what is called a gene length uh, file, and we will need that later on. Um, what do we want to have to? So um, in the option for parent uh, read, so option for parent, we have several information. Do we want to count fragment instead of read? Uh, we want to count the, the, we want, what do we want already? I'm sorry, I'm lost. Uh, we want to count the fragment. Um, so we want to count the fragment instead of the reads. Um, And in advanced options, so we want to be sure that we we filter that we count the number of read mapping on the exons and aggregate that at the level of the level of the gene. It's what we say there. Um, we don't want the reads to map to multiple locations. Um, the minimum mapping quality per read is zero there. And I think that's ah no, we say ten here. Sorry, um, to be sure that we are consistent. Here, so we want at least uh, we want to to consider only the read that have at least a mapping quality of ten, and then we can you can check the other parameters. Uh, you can uh, I recommend you to check the other parameters, but then you can run the fast QC. The sorry features count. Um, we will, as we did already for the other uh, tools, uh, so we will aggregate the report from features counts using MultiQC. Uh, once when it's okay for the tools to be such. Okay, there is some delay in the interface. It happens, no worries. Um, it's, everything is fine. Okay. I will just reload the interface. It can happen sometimes that we lose um, the interface can be a bit slower, slower to load. I will search for the tool again, MultiQC. Then I will start it while oh features count is already done, so I can select features count. I use I select the diff the both summaries that has been generated in the, the history and I will run execute. Oh, I lost it. Yeah, true, because I reload the interface. So I go back to transcriptomics, um, reference-based rns data analysis, and counting the number of reads per, counting reads per genes. And I'm currently there. Multi QC, I aggregate the result. Um, and then the different questions that we have are how many reads has been assigned to a genes and when we should worry about the assignment rate and what should we do. So we just wait until fast QC, multi QC is done. It will just, it will be fast. It should be fast. Um, but then, okay, it's done. So I can visualize. So um, sixty percent of the around sixty percent of the reads has been assigned to to uh, a feature. Specifically here, we selected only the exon, so it has been assigned to exon. If we look there, we have a percentage. So. 60%, 63% has been assigned to Exxon, 9% um, has been neither unsigned or unmapped, um, some were um, unassigned because the mapping quality was too low, uh, some were uh, not assigned because multi-mapped, uh, some were as, uh, not assigned because there were, there were no features uh, really interesting there, and some were ambiguous. The next question was, uh, when do, should we worry? Um, I will say that when the percentage is below of uh, assignment, mm -hmm. is below, to, is below um, 50%, then you should investigate where your reads have been mapped. So are they mapped inside genes? And 
uh, check if the annotations correspond to the correct reference genome version. So it's happening also that you select one version of your reference genome for the mapping and then the annotations you have a different version. So then um, they are mapping, they are mapped correctly but not uh, to genes that are known or not in the correct location of the genes. But the main output of features count that we can see is this uh, what we call the counts file. If you open it, you will see that uh, it's a big table where you have uh, the first column is the gene ID. So here you have the ID of the genes. And the second column is how many reads have been mapped to this specific gene here. So here you have one, 197 reads that has been mapped to this specific gene. Um, and one question that we have is which feature are the most count uh, on both samples. Um, for that you can use the sort tools to sort these tables by uh, a descending order to have on the top the output and you can identify that. I uh, will let you do that on your own. Um, so now we have the count uh, read. We have, we have counting the number of reads that map to the different genes for the two samples, so 80 and 77. Um, but it will be for you. I will recommend you to do the same procedure as we did. So the upload quality control mapping counting for the other data sets uh, to check um, how did you, uh, if you understood the, the correct, uh, how to do that, but also how to do when you have single end data. So you will find the same the data on the same locations in the data libraries. So we, we have the FASTQ file on the top um, and where you can also find them on the node. Now that we have the cons for the two uh, for the samples, we would like to do the differential expression, gene expression analysis. So to do that, we need uh, all data sets, so the seven samples, to be analyzed following the same procedure. As I mentioned, you could do it on your own. Um, but to save time, we already ran the previous step for you. And we obtained seven files with the cons for each gene in Drosophila for each samples. So now we will import these seven files into a new history and run the differential expression analysis together. So for the first things we need to do is we need to create a new data set, a new history. So we will create a new history and we will call it RNA seek RNA seek um, differential expression um, analysis. Okay. We need to import the data and as before they are located in the same location as before. So you go in the top, share data, data libraries. Um, then you do you go to the GTN material, um, then you will go to transcriptomics. The time it loading. Transcriptomics. Reference-based RNA seq data analysis, the folder called UI, and then we will select all the files where that are named dot cons. Be careful, don't use the dot exon cons, but the dot cons. So you select. You should select seven files. So you have uh, 76, 77, 78. Then 77 here, 70, 80, 81, and 82. And then you export it to your new history. You import it into your history. You go back to Galaxy. The main interface, you rename them, these files, to be sure that you keep only the interesting part from the naming. So let's do that. So it takes a few minutes to do that for each 
sometimes here. One more and we should be good now. So we have now seven files in our, our new history um, from 76 to 82. Um, so our new history, oop, yeah, true. We al I always forgot that we need to reload the tutorials after we changed page. So I go to the reference space, there are an data analysis, and then on the left I go to the analysis of differential expression. So we rename the history. So we now have, if we look at our, each of the files, so we just have a view, view, quick vision here, we can see that for each of the different files, so we have a first column with the column with the gene ID, with the same, and the second column, the second column are the number of genes that are mapped to this particular gene for this data set. So we could compare the file directly and calculate the ex extent of the differential gene expression doing, by doing that, but it's not that simple. So just let's imagine that we have RNA-seq uh, count from three samples for genomes with four genes. So we have sample 1, sample 2, sample 3, and gene 1, gene A, gene B, gene C, gene D. If we look at the, the, the samples, we can see already that for, gene three, for sample 3, um, we have much more read for each of the genes, regularly for more than the other replicates for all the genes. So it means that this sample 3 has a higher sequencing depth than the other replicates. The other thing that we can have a look is that gene A, gene B, is twice longer as, as long as gene A. So it might explain why we have twice as many read regardless of the replicate. So the number of sequencing reads mapped to a specific gene depend then on the sequencing depth of the sample, but also on the gene length of the gene. So to compare samples and gene, exp or gene expressions, we need to normalize our gene counts. For that, we could use uh, something that is called the TPM, transcript per million kilobase, or RPKM or FPKM. If you want more explanation of what are the different terms, I recommend you to look at this expandable box. But RNA-seq is often used to compare one tissue to the others, for example, muscle with epithelial tissues. And then you could have a lot of uh, muscle-specific genes that are, that you have a lot of muscle-specific genes that are transcript, I mean, transcript in muscle but not in the epithelial genes. And it's what we call the difference in library compositions. We can have the same, um, to see a similar difference uh, in library compositions if um, after knockout of a gene. Um, so, for example, let's imagine that we have a rna account from two samples, sample 1 and sample 2, that have the same library size. So they have both uh, 640, 635 reads for a genome of six genes. So the genes have the same expression in both samples except one. The only the gene, the sample 1 here, um, express... Um, transcribe the gene D, but not the sample 2. And it's really a high level here. It's a more than 500 read there. So it means that the 500 read that are used that we can see here, if we have the same number of read in total, they have to be spread over the other genes here in sample 2. For the read count, it's, it's implying that, for example, here we have the feeling that uh, sample 2 is almost 10 times more expressed. The gene F in sample 2 is 10 times more expressed than in sample 1. But it's only because of a differential, a differentially expressed genes, just because of the gene D here. Um, 
And the, the TPM, RPKM or FPKM, doesn't deal with this difference in number composition in normalizations. But we need to, to use more complex tools like DSEC2. So DSEC2 is a great tool for dealing with RNA-seq data and running differential gene expression analysis. It takes the raw count that we, as we have now in our history, applies a normalization for sequencing depths and library compositions, and do other, some a statistical analysis there. Um, and then, so it for the differential gene expression. So the, you can, if you are interested in how the normalization in DSEC is running to do the. Sequencing type, both the sequencing type and library composition, I recommend you to, to, to read this, uh, normally, this expandable box. So DSEC2 runs, as I mentioned already, the differential gene expression analysis, and that took uh, where the two basic tasks are to estimate the biological variance using the replicate for each conditions and estimate the significance of the, ex the expression difference between any two conditions. So um, this expression analysis is made from the read counts and, um, and some attempts are made to correct for the variability in measurement using replicates. So we need at least three replicates and the best is five replicates per condition to be able to have a good statistical power there. Um, and I'm talking about biological replicate, not technical replicate. If you want to know more about the, the difference between technical and biological replicate, again, have a look to this expandable box. And in the DSEC, multiple factor uh, with several levels can be incorporated in the analysis to describe the different uh, source, possible source of variations. It can be the treatment, it can be the tissue, gender, patches, etc. Um, and it helps to, to, to do the correct uh, statistical analysis. So in our case, so in our data sets, we know um, two type, two possible factors that can impact our expressions. The treatment, so the depletion of the, of the bacillus genes, but also the sequencing type. If it's parent or single it can impact really the number of reads that are mapped to the different genes. But here, what we are more interested in is the treatment. So, which is the impact of the treatment? So, we will put that as the first factor. The sequencing type is an information that we want to correct for, but it's not our main um, goal and what we would like to know more. Um, so a quick comment, so we recommend you to add all factors you think may affect the gene expression in your experiment. It can be sequencing type here, it can be other types. Just before uh, doing the TSEC analysis, I recommend, we recommend you to just slow down, take the time and evaluate what are the different possible factors for that. So now we will run DSEC. So to run DSEC, so go back to Galaxy, you search for DSEC2 in the tools box, and then you open DSEC2. You say how we want, you want to select dataset per level, um, and then we will define different levels. So the first level that will be will be the treatment. We will put as a first uh, factor, uh, so the first factor is the treatment, uh, we will put as a first uh, level of this factor, so the different levels will be the treated and untreated. So the first level is treated, so we select, it should be three, uh, three files there, so here are the count that are in our history. So we select the different samples that are treated, that are treated and it's already written in the name there. You can you need to put untreated then and you select the four files for that. So here we have the first factor which is the treatment with the treated untreated. Then we have a second factor as we mentioned that is a sequencing. So we put a factor name that will be sequencing. sequencing. 
The first level of this factor will be if we have parent data and then we need to select we should have four samples where paired is in the in the name and then you put single end you put that we have single data here um, the data do th the data doesn't have any either here if you look there there is no either we want the count data uh, the input data are from features count we want to visualize the other analysis result we want to output the normalized count table um, and that's all then you can start dsec2 just quickly check again yep so as you remember I will to click select multiple data sets um, if you have more complex or uh, large sample sets I recommend you we have created a tutorial to explain you how to use group tax and other things to help you process that and putting your data to correctly to dsec2 so DSEC2 will generate three outputs. The first output will be a normalized count table. So it's it's a combination of all these seven files of these seven samples in a big table. So with the same the genes, uh, the first column will be the gene ID, and then seven column with the, for the different uh, samples with the normalized count for these samples in this gene. The second file in DSEC is a plot. The plot will, uh, with uh, some some graphics, to check the quality of your of your analysis. And then we have a, what is called the DSEC result file, which is a big table with for all the genes some statistics, and it's what we will use to extract the differential expression, differentially expressed genes. DSEC is now done and as expected it generated three outputs. The first output that we can see in our history is the normalized count table. So if you expand it, you can you can open it. You will see that um, you can even visualize it. Um, you will have a big table with first column being the gene ID, the different column are the different samples and in, in the in the cell there, you have the normalized count for this sample and for these genes there. Um, we will not use that uh, directly, we will use the, this file later. The second file that DSEC is generating is uh, the plot file, in which we have some, some plots to check the quality of the, of the analysis. And the first plot that we have is what we call a PCA uh, plot. Um, where we can see um, how the variability of our data can be represented when when um, when uh, displayed on a two two D uh, graphs. Um, I will not explain what is a PCA uh, in details. If you want to know more about what is a PCA, if you never heard about it, I recommend you to expand this box and read more about that. Um, and so the f here we can see that the first two components of our PCA analysis, um, and especially the first one that represents uh, more than 50% of our variability of our data, I'm talking about just based on the normalized count table, not no, no statistic analysis has been done, just based on the normalized count table. Uh, more than 50% of variability, you can see that it can discriminate uh, two groups of samples. So this one here on the left, this one on the on the right. Um, and you see that all the samples on the left are all the untreated, so the controlled samples, and on the right are the treated samples. So in our data, we so it's what we can um, uh, uh, extract from this plot is that the fact that the we can clearly see a discrimination in our sample uh, just in the normalized count table you can you can you have a, a discriminations between the treated samples and untreated samples 
just on the normalized count table without no other statistics. So there are no, uh, we don't know which genes or etc. It's just based on the big table of that we opened before. And the second axis of variability, uh, it's what is represented there. Uh, it seems to discriminate the paired end data sets and the single end data sets are on the top. So it means that the, the two factors, so the first factor that we used, so the paired versus unpaired, uh, sorry, the treated versus untreated, it seems to be a good way of discriminating our, our samples one from each other. So it's a good uh, factor that we used, and it's the main factor to differentiate our samples. And the second factor that we use, which is the type of sequencing, seems to have a still a good, like 20, almost 30% of the variability of our data can be explained by just because of the type of sequencing that has been used. So it's really good that we used that, we put that in our uh, factors for, the, for then doing the proper uh, statistical analysis. The second uh, plot that we see there is uh, sample to sample uh, distance. So it takes uh, from the normalized count table, take the distance between these samples and this sample here, for example, and compute the distance between uh, just based on the on the normalized count, uh, compute a distance um, for all the samples and compute uh, and, and output that in this in this heat map there. The darker is it, the closer it is. So it's normal that the, the, so this one and this one, they are the same sample. So it's normal that the, the, uh, the so it means the distance is really small. It means that this, the, they are similar here, but it's normal if they are the same sample. So the darker is it, uh, the closer these samples are together. And you have a, some sort of clustering on the top here to represent that. So you see that, these two samples are close, so this sample and this sample are really close to each other. So the the histogram, the uh, sorry, clustering that you see on the top and on the left is the same. Um, so you see that this one are close to each other, this one are close to each other, and it's expected. So here we have the treated paired paired data and they are closer together. Here you have untreated paired data together. And then you see that the treated are in the same group, the untreated are in the same group, etc. So it's clear, it's clear that the treatment has a big impact as we already saw in the PCA component. And I will not go in details about the other graphs. I recommend you to check on the tutorial. There is more explanation about the other the other um, the other files um, yeah. and then I will explain I will have a look at the next uh, files which is a dsec2 result file if you open it you will see a big table there um, with the first column being the gene ID so the same as we extracted before and then some statistics so the base mean the log2 fold change uh, the standard deviation, the VAL test, the p-value, and uh, the adjusted p-value. Um, so then, for each of the of the of the gene there, we can see if um, if this genes has been differentially expressed or not, and with which uh, log to fold change, and if it's significant or not using the p-value there. Um, and so, uh, just be careful with the with the with the value of the log to fold change. So, if it's minus, it means I always uh, need to check again. Um, so, the log to fold change are about on the primary factor level one versus level two. So, the order that you used in uh, in the in the factor levels for the first the in the factor levels for the first factor is really important. And because we put the treated sample first and after untreated, it means that the the first factor is a the first level is a treatment. So it means that 
Um, if you have a plus there, it's upregulated, so more expressed in the treated sample compared to the untreated sample, so and it's minus, it's less regulated, so less expressed in the genes in the treated sample. I mean, I recommend you to check again regularly because I always struggle with that. With that. Um, so based on that, so you can you can really extract which genes are upregulated or downregulated in the treat in the treated sample compared to the untreated samples, and extract them also based on for the ones that are significant. Um, you have some question here, is the gene, the, these genes differentially expressed because of the treatment? If yes, how much? Uh, so it's uh, 30, uh, 3360, so 3360 this one. It seems to be downregulated, so less expressed in the treated sample than in the untreated samples with the log to fold change of almost 3. Um, and there is other questions afterwards. Okay, I lost here. Um, I recommend you to, to go through the different questions there. I will not do it now, but take the time and do it. The next steps that we would like to do is to extract and annotate the differentially expressed genes. So the first things we want to do is to extract the genes that are a significant uh, p-value. That it means that the, the p-value, or specifically the adjusted p-value there, um, is significant with a threshold of 5%. So please follow this enzyme section, extract the most differentially expressed genes by following the different steps that are explained there. As I mentioned before, I run the filter tool, so I can show you quickly. So the idea of the I run that on the DSEC2 result files with the following conditions that we want to extract all the line, the rows where the colon 7, where the uh, uh, adjusted p-value is, uh, is below 0 0.05. And so I execute it and I renamed it right after by clicking there. And what we can see here is, um, so here, if you expand that, no, sorry, not the wrong file, here, you see that we are we we have more than t uh, seventeen thousand lines, but after doing this uh, filtering for all, keeping only the the rows with the significant p-value, we have uh, or a bit more than one thousand lines. So it's um, this number of these genes with a differentially express um, expression. Um, and once uh, then I run again a filter tools again on this uh, on the genes on this uh, uh, files with the significant adjusted fixing p value and the idea was then to extract the genes uh, where the p value is significant but also with the log to fall change is higher than one or below minus one so then um, the Column with the log to fold change is three. Is, uh, the column three, so it's what we put there, and we want the genes where the p the fold change is higher than one or uh, below uh, minus one. So it means that the absolute value is uh, superior to one there, and then it will mean that the the fold change is higher than 2 or minus, minus 2, or below minus 2. And then we, we extracted uh, 130 lines there. It's what we have now. Um, it's what we use there. Um, and then we have, um, if we expand this file, now we have uh, the same information as before. So the gene ID and the statistic there. But the gene ID are not so interesting then. Then, we could be more interested to add uh, extra information that we we that, um, for example, the locations of these genes, uh, but also some better gene names. So to do that, uh, we can use a tool that is called uh, annotate dsec to output. Um, so. I'm sorry, I don't understand why it's reloading every time. Um, 
So, extraction and annotations of the differentially expressed genes. Um, so for that, uh, we need to use the, D the GTF file that we used before, so you can uh, import it from your previous history and then use the annotate dsec to output uh, tables uh, tool that will use uh, that will add some extra information like the chromosome start and uh, strands, features, and gene names. I will do it quickly, but without uh, going too much in detail then, so you can follow what I'm doing, but then, yeah. Um, so, I go... View history uh, to visualize all my histories. I have all my histories then I can see there, and what I want to do is then to get my GTF file there, so you could do that uh, by dragging and dropping it here, or you can import it again from from uh, Zenodo. Then you go back to Galaxy, and then you search for the tool annotate dsec to um, annotate dsec dsec two. Mm. Annotate dsec to outputs tables. You use uh, the tabular outputs will be the filtering one. You want uh, the input is a dsec uh, adder, and you want to add the reference genome that will be this one there. Dsec is now done. Uh, so if we expand it, we see that we have um, the g the the different column with the gene uh, ID and some, if we go there, we have some extra information that, that has been added, like the chromosome, uh, the positions on the chromosome, the strand, and some extra information about the type of, of uh, features it is, so protein coding and the gene names. But as we see, we lost here the first uh, information, which means wh what are the different columns there. So we need to add this, it would be useful to add this information. So to do that, um, we need to we need to add an extra. We would like to add an extra line that will add uh, the name of the different columns. So to do that, I recommend you to um, go to the tutorials and check add column names. You copy there. Uh, we will add as a new file the first column name then and then concatenate the data sets. So copy that here. Um, and then you go to the small top thing on the top where you can upload data. You go to patch, uh, past and fetch data there. You add the what you copied there. You say that the type of is tabula, tabula here. Um, in the settings, you can say that you want to. Yeah, you you say that, that's all, and you start it, and you close it, and then we will check what is the output of the pasted entry, and then we will use a tool that is called concatenate, concatenate, so it's concatenate datasets, um, yeah. No, it's the other one. There is two of them. I recommend you to do this one, to use this one. So we just wait until this one is done. But then the idea would be to pass first put the pasted entries and then added uh, the annotate GSEC uh, as an output. I will, we will just check the output of the pasted entry first. To be sure, though, we see that that it's correctly it's uh, it's 13 column that has been added. So here you have the name, the number of columns on the top. So then we can run the annotate uh, concatenate datasets, and then on the tutorials we recommend you to rename uh, these uh, generated files because of to keep track of what is it inside. So what you can do it while it's uh, even if it's not running or if it's not finished here. 
and then you will you will check the outputs that you have 30 131 lines with the first line being the name of the of the column we now have our files with our with our gene significant genes with significant or oh, interesting p values we would like now to visualize them so uh, one thing we could do is we could plot the log to fold change um, but then one thing we usually we are usually ask or we want to to do is to visualize like a heat map of the of the um, of the expressions um, for the different samples so it's what we will try to do now um, is to visualize uh, the expression of the differentially expressed genes so we will first extract and plot the normalized count for these genes for each sample using a heat map and then compute and extract the plot the sorts that score for normalized counts um, but here it's just a quick uh, possible visualization that we will do but if you want to do more details and you want to do to go more in depth i recommend you to check these two tutorials there that are visualization of rna seq results with itmap 2 which go further than what we will do now but also uh, how to plot that with volcano plots um, now, so visualization of the normalized count. The first things we want to do is to extract from the normalized count the one that are uh, um, the 131, the lines for the the verse for the 131 genes that are interesting for us. So we need to join the normalized counts with the genes with significant uh, adjusted p-value and fold change to extract just the, the, the rows that are overlapping on the column one so with the same gene ID. So, and then we will just keep the column uh, one to eight uh, that are delimited by a tab and we will rename it normalized count for the most differentially expressed sheets. So then we will have a table of 130 lines um, and then on that we will be able to plot a heat map then. So um, I will do that now. So just join two data sets. Join two data sets side by side. Um, so the first one we want to do is to normalize the count table on column one, which is where the gene ID are. Then uh, the second we want to join with the genes with significant p-value on the column one. Um, we want to keep lines on the first output that don't join no. We want to keep lines on the first uh, input that are incomplete no. We want to fill the empty column no. We want to keep the either yes. I think I need to check again. Feel free to check again. So here. Um, and then we can execute it and the second step is to cut um, to keep only the column with the normalized counts which are the beginning so then the, so as uh, to explain so the join will really uh, join these two data sets so it will add the column from the second file so where the, the statistics from the, these genes are on the count, on the normalized count. So we need to just then uh, output to cut this column that has been added. So we need to cut. There is a tool for that that is called cut. Um, cut column from a table. Then you say you want to cut and keep only the column one to eight on the joint data sets and you can execute it. So just to check that what we did, so here you can view the output of the join data sets. You see that you have the column ID, you see that you have these 131 lines, you have the gene, the sample names on the top, and then you have this statistic that has been added. And so we want to keep, with the, join, with the cut, we want to keep only these first eight columns there. Once we are done with that, with the cut, so we can already rename it here with the normalized count for the most differentially expressed gene. Oops, sorry. Here. And 
and save it. And if you expand that, you see that you have now only the eight column, interesting column. And the next step that we want to do is to create a heat map of that. So it's map two. You can search for it map two. Um, then it map two, the normalized count for the most differentially expressed genes. Um, you, we, what we want to do is to plot a heat map. Um, with the normalized count, we want to visualize uh, to have a, a, a transformation that with the log2 values transformed by data, enable clustering, label colon but not the row, and coloring uh, groups. So we want to plot log2 values of my data. I want to enable clustering. We want to cluster uh, rows but not column. What I said, I forgot already. Um, yes, we want to label, label column, label my column, but not my rows. So we want to have the, sam the sample names on the top, but we don't want to see all the names of the genes. And we want the coloring to be blue for the uh, value below, below zero, white to zero, and red for the top. And that's, we can execute that. So it will create a heat map similar to that. So you should check that later if it's similar. And please, once it's done, please answer the question that is there. So while the heat map is, doing, is running, we will also uh, want to, to compute the dead score because it's something we all often see in the, in the publications. So the z-score gives the number of standard deviation that a value is away from the mean of all value in the same group. So it's a good way to somehow normalize our data and make the, the different uh, expressions more comparable between the different genes. Um, so to save time on these uh, tutorials, we will compute the z-score directly on the normalized count of the that we extracted of the most differentially expressed genes. But uh, normally you do that on all genes, so on the normalized count file from DSEC, and then filter for the interesting uh, genes. So I will recommend you to do that. But so to compute a z-score, we need to do two steps. We need first to uh, subtract to each uh, va e value, so uh, to each cell, we need to subtract the means uh, the mean value of the whole row. Um, and we will on the normalized count tables and then divide these uh, values that we computed by the standard deviations of the same rows. So we need to do two steps. We need to compute first uh, the normalized, uh, the two, we need to do these two steps where we first do uh, s uh, a minus, so this first step, so it's what we will do there. So we'll compute the, t the table means one, so it means we will compute the means uh, per row, one is meaning per row, and then we want to, to subscribe, to subtract, sorry, the means uh, for each of the rows. It's a bit complicated, but I, it's, it's the way it is. Um, and then we will do the same by dividing uh, we will have two tables. We will add the first table, which is the normalized count, and then the output of the table one, and we want to divide the table two, so the one that we compute there, by the standard deviation from the normalized count there, with the same ID as before. Table here is subtract, sub is for subtract, divide is for dividing, and SDD is for standard deviations, mean is for mean. So we will do that now. So we search for table compute. Compute operations on data table on table data. Um, so the first one we want to we have only one uh, table. So I check again. We have a single table. We uh, we check the normalized count table and then we will perform what we call perform a full oper table operations. So single table, blah, blah, something. And what we want to do is perform a full table operations. The operations will be a custom one. 
And then what I recommend you to do is to is to copy what I we put there, but trying to we have I added we added the explanation there. So feel free to go back and check again. And execute. And then we will run a second table compute then on multiple table where the first table will be the normalized count from the differentially expressed genes and the second table will be the output of the table compute and the custom expressions is uh, the one I mentioned before which is uh, table 2 dot, div dot so dividing the second table by the standard deviations on the row of the second of the first table and here it's this one and you can execute and while it's running you oops sorry you can also rename uh, the output here and here you rename it here you save it and once it's one, once it's it's running, uh, it's done. I recommend you to to check the question. So, what is the range of the z-score? What can we say about the z-score for the differential expression? And can you, we use the z-score to estimate the strengths of the differential differential expression of a genes? So the two table computes are now done. So if you open, you expand the z-score here. You should have a file like this with your eight uh, columns, the gene ID and some value there. Um, you have some questions as I mentioned um, and you can, yeah, you have the Z score there. So now we would like to do, to plot a heat map with the Z score. So it's what uh, is asked in the tutorial. It's to, to plot some similar heat map. So we will use the Z score there. Do we plot the data as it is? We want to enable data clusterings and we want to label columns but not the rows and the coloring would be the same as before. So plot Z score, the data as it is, clustering, uh, label uh, the column but not the rows and the coloring blue to red to white. Um, while it's running the heat maps, you can check the first heat map. You should have already done that to be sure but I want to display it. If it's there, here yeah, you should have a heat map similar to that. It should be similar than the to the one that we had. So it's I just open this one. So you should have a similar to this one here, and here you see there where you see that the three teeth samples. So it's here just on the normalized count tables we see that the sample, the treated samples and untreated samples, so the untreated are clustered together, the treated uh, together, um, and but we expected that, uh, you remember, from the plots, from the output, uh, from the plot from DSEC. And if we look now at the z-score, so here is the last one, you see really like that same, the treated samples are together, uh, the treated samples are together, untreated samples are together, and you clear, uh, see a clear distinction that all these genes are um, more expressed in the treated compared to the untreated, and there are these groups, and they are highly expressed there compared to the untreated, and the same for the other one. So you have a clear separation between. So you have two groups of genes, and it would be maybe interesting to look at these genes. Why are there cluster? Are they have similar expressions and things? Um, but to do that, to help doing that, so you could have a look at these particular genes one by one, um, uh, getting used to getting more information about them, uh, looking at different database. Uh, but another way also to help you doing that is uh, by doing, um, it's by doing uh, what we will do now, which is uh, functional enrichment analysis. Um, and knowing uh, they become, uh, they come from similar uh, uh, 
categories or um, that uh, belongs to similar biological functions. And it's what we will do now. We look at this file, so we see two groups of, of genes, as I mentioned already. Um, and the question is now, how this, are these genes related to each other? That do they come from, do they, build, do they perform similar functions? Or what are, why are they clustered together? One thing we could do is to check manually all these genes there and see if they how they create it or they they are together um, but another way to do that and help doing that is to you is to do what we call a functional arrangement analysis um, and it's what we will do now um, I'm sorry so I reload the the page so I need to go back to the is to the tutorials again and so it's a functional arrangement analysis it's what we will do. And the first, uh, there is different type of analysis that we, we can do. And the first one, what we will do is what is called a gene ontology analysis. Uh, the gene ontology, um, you can open the, the, the tab there, um, it's re uh, redirect there. So a gene ontology uh, resource um, um, is a comprehensive and computational model of biological systems that go from molecular to organisms levels across the different species of the tree of life. So the idea is to try to find or define groups of genes um, and or yeah or different um, groups um, that are similar different the different organisms. Um, and so uh, we can do that on uh, differentially expressed genes to, to see if, how the, the, the differentially expressed genes uh, are together, if they come from the same groups or not. There is different uh, methods for doing that, but um, the standard method uh, could give some biased results for rna data due to overexpression of differentially exp the different expressions of uh, long genes or long transcripts. And so uh, we will use then a tool that is called GoTech that provides a method uh, that um, takes the length of the genes into account. Um, we will apply it first on, on Go terms or so gene ontology terms, but we can use it also on cake pathway as we will uh, discuss further. For GoSec, we need two types of files. We need, um, and how do we know that? So if you go to the GoSec uh, tools and if you search for the GoSec tools and you open it, um, you need two files for, for that. You need the uh, differentially expressed gene files, which is, uh, as explained here, a tabular file with the first column being the gene IDs and then the true or false in the second columns. Um, and if we go down, you have some input, more inputs about the files. So the... the Sorry, the first column could be the gene ID, um, and yep. And as you see, the gene ID should be um, as um, sorry uh, uppercase. So we need to create this type of files where we have the gene ID and true or false if the genes is differentially expressed or not. Um, and the second file that we need is a gene length files, which is the gene ID and then the length of this file. And we already did that, compute that when we run the features count, if you remember. But the first steps, we need to do that. We need to compute this file. Um, and so to do, to create that, we need to, we will take our dsec file where the dsec result file, where we have the gene ID and some statistic then. And in particular, the information that we want to have is um, if the genes is differentially expressed, so if the p-value is significant. And we want to add to this file an uh, uh, extra column that say uh, true or false, if the genes is differentially expressed or not. Um, this true or false in, in computer science language is called a Boolean. And we want to then transform the information about if the seven columns is below 0 0.5 uh, into a boolean. So we will uh, compute, add an expression that is called boolean 
and then it's exactly what is said there. So we will do that, we will create that, and we will then do uh, some formatting then. So the first step we need to do is to search for the compute um, tool, which is compute an expression on every row. And so the expression is we want to have to know if the seven column is zero is true is below 0 0.05 and transform that as a boolean and we want to do that on the desec result file here we will execute that and then we want um, in our file we don't want to have all the desec result all the statistic we just want to have this information which is the gene id and the and the last column that has been added uh, with the compute, so C1 and C8. And once we did that, um, if you remember, uh, the, if you look, it's the same here, uh, the gene ID here are not all uppercase, and we, here you have a lowercase here. And we know that GOSEC needs uppercase. So we want to do something that is called change case to put the first column as uppercase. Um, where is change case of selected column? And then on the cut, we want to change the case and we want to move it to uppercase. So I run that and once it's done, I want to rename that last file as return gene ID and differentially expression. Mm, and so I will rename that here. So I will just first check what uh, the different step did. So it's a creating, it's written here that it created a eight, column eight with the expression boolean here. So if we open it here, we will see that uh, we have the gene ID and the information that we got in the DSEC plus an extra column that is true here. And you need to really scroll down really a lot to see that at some point it will change from true to false. Uh, when we eat this uh, 0.05, it should be soon here. So you see that here we are below 0 0.05, so it's still true. And when we are higher than 0 0.05, it's false. It's saying that this gene, starting from here and below, the genes are not differentially expressed. Um, but one thing that we see here is that the number of line here is not the full numbers. Uh, some line has been skipped because there were no information anymore. So starting from line uh, this line here, um, there were no informations about the gene, uh, if the genes are differentially expressed or not. So uh, the compute removed, the compute tools removed this line. The cut uh, started uh, here, just cut the, line, the column. And then we have a correctly formatted files where we have the gene ID in uppercase and true or false here. Now we want to have also the gene lengths. Uh, we need to have that, and we already re uh, created that files before with the feature scans. And so we go back to your history, to your multiple history, and you can drag and drop this file here. So take it and drag and drop it in the new history. And as before, so. Same as for the other ones, you see that the gene ID is not uppercase, so we need to change case to have it uppercase. Change case uh, to have the first column as uppercase here. So we want the first column to be uppercase. Um, and we want to rename it. I don't remember the name again. Oh, true. We we change the page, so we need to reload the tutorial. We are in the row of we are trying to fix that. It should be better pretty soon. Um, so gene ID and length here, and we will rename that change case here to that here. Um, 
And then when it's done, we run to run go sec. So go sec, and what we will give it, we will give the gene ID and fit differentially express, so gene ID and gene lengths. Just a quick thing, we don't need these uh, data sets anymore, the edit data the tags, so feel free to remove them, just that they don't pollute your history there. Um, so, gene ID different and differentiated expression, so the gene ID plus true files in the second column, gene ID and gene lengths, it's just what we just created, so here we have the gene ID and lengths. You want to get the categories, you want to have uh, uh, you do that for the genome DM6. Uh, the gene ID are ensemble gene ID. We want to extract the GO terms, uh, so for cellular component, biological component, and molecular component. Um, you can have a look to the different methods options and advanced options, um, but the things we want to do now in the output is to plot uh, top GO terms and extract the differentially expressed gene for the different categories. So associate when we have a go terms, um, interesting go terms uh, to know uh, which genes belong to these go terms. Uh, so and we can execute that. So it will create four three files. Uh, so the first file um, that we will have a look at is this ranked category list. Um, so it's uh, it's similar. It's um, similar a bit similar. A not really. So it's some statistics. So you have the categories, um, you have the overrepresented p-value, underrepresented p-value, the number of differentially expressed genes in this category, number of genes in this category, and the terms. So ex more explanation about the terms. So for example, here we have the go terms categories, the p-value. So if the, this uh, category is overrepresented in the differentially expressed genes, the p-value is there. Um, is these categories, if the differentially expressed genes underrepresented in this category compared to the general, uh, all the genes is there, and then we have some, we know that it's, it's uh, these goal terms is related to the extracellular region. Um, once you have the goal terms, um, and from this file, so you can have a look to the category there if you want, you can search for goal terms here to get more more details about that um, in this website so you have uh, more um, details, information, uh, indirect annotation to extracellular list of genes etc. Yeah. So once you extract it, some interesting uh, uh, go terms it can be something you can do. But then the first step uh, and it's what is asked in the tutorials uh, is to extract how many go terms are overrepresented uh, with the adjusted p value of 0 0.05 and how many are underrepresented. So, to do that, um, you can use a tool that is called filtering filter that will uh, extract only the row. We already used it before. That will, um, whoop, where is the filter? Um, filter, what is the name already? The full name of the... Ah. It can be a bit cumbersome to find it. Uh, so filter... Wah. Filter data, maybe, will help to find this tool. Filter, filter tabular? Nope. Sorry, um, I'm a bit... What we can do, because we already ran it before, so... Was it this one? Nope, it is concatenate. So we have a filter tools here. Um, we can rerun that, but on the last uh, go sec, so on the ranked, we want the second column. So we want to have the second column that are 0 0.05. So why did I say that? So we want to have 
the overrepresented p-value. So we want to have the go terms where the p-value for the overrepresented is below 0 0.05. So it's what we ask there. And you can do the same for the underrepresented to get the information there. Um, So it's a question here. So you will find that you have 31 go terms. So it's 0.27% of your of the go terms that are overrepresented, 83 underrepresented. And for the overrepresented, you can group the, this data to know if they come mostly from uh, molecular functions, so MF molecular functions, cellular a component, or biological process. And to do to know that, you can group your day, you can group the data there. So here, you see, it's what you get there. Um, the second file that you have uh, with, go, with the Go terms is, um, is a graph with the top 10 overrepresented Go terms. So if you go on the top, oops, sorry, here, yeah, top 10, you will, if you open this file here, sorry, I have sometimes some issues with Galaxy interface to load the PDF, so I need to reload my interface. So here you see that you have uh, the percentage. Here you have a graphs where the top ten uh, overrepresented categories for CC, so for cellular component, biological function, and molecular functions, and you have the percentage of differentially expressed genes in these categories, and so you know that extracellular functions. Uh, more than 20% of the genes in these categories are over are differentially expressed. Um, exhaust metabolic process, etc. So it could be a good way to, to identify some genes that are uh, differentially expressed. Um, I checked again and if we had I think we had a question but I don't remember. Uh, we'll go back to I go back to the east to the tutorials. And then here, oops, so it was functional arrangement analysis here. Um, and you have a question, so why, what is the x-axis, how is it computed? Um, it's uh, the percentage of differentially expressed uh, genes in these categories. The third uh, uh, file is a table with the differentially expressed genes associated to the Go terms. Um, so what you can see here in this file, is uh, for the, these categories um, that are a differentiated expressions, which uh, uh, interesting categories, which are the different uh, differentially expressed genes in these categories. Um, it's a good way to maybe if you are interested in these particular categories and you want to plot maybe the heat map for the for the z-score for these genes. So this file will help you to identify interesting genes to plot maybe for for your heat map. If you want to go further in this type of analysis, uh, we, we, we add another tutorial that is called rna -seq Genes to Pathway, that where you will learn a different uh, other type of gene set enrichment analysis. The last step that we want to, to cover here in the functional enrichment analysis is the CAKE Pathway. Um, so CAKE Pathway is a, da is a database is a collection of pathways that represent the correct knowledge of the molecular interaction, reactions and rela relation networks. So it's a good way to, to, to find, to, to, represent, um, to represent your, your different uh, genes, protein, RNAs, com component in a, in, a, in a general way. So, for example, you have this, um, this pathway here that is called DME00010, which represents the glycolysis uh, process, where you see the different, uh, the different component in this, uh, in, this in this pathway. And so we can uh, do some sort of uh, cake uh, arrangement to identify pathway where we have a lot of differentially expressed genes. Yeah, and for that we can use exactly the same tools, um, GoSec. So what we can do here is just rerunning GoSec here, 
But uh, what we want to say is we don't want to extract the go terms but the cake pathway. And we don't want to plot the uh, out with the top 10 um, uh, here, but we want to extract the differentially expressed gene for the different categories. And you execute it and it will take some time as before and you can you will run that. So while a uh, keg is running, so it will uh, the statistic will be similar as the one for grow terms. So you will have a big table that uh, uh, where you can find how many keg pathways has been identified, how many are represented, uh, underrepresented, um, what are the overrepresented keg pathway terms, um, etc. Um, so I recommend you to to do these questions afterwards to get more information. And similar, you will have a table uh, with the cake pathway ID and what are the differentially expressed genes associated to this pathway. Um, but then it can be still uh, one good thing. So you could also represent your differentially expressed genes as a pathway. Uh, uh, in a visualized way, a visualization way. So it means we would like to see this type of pathway here and see which part of this pathway are differentially expressed. Um, so to do that, there is a tool that is called PassView that will generate similar output as that. So to do that, you can. You, what you need to do is to extract the interest in column from the. Um, you need to, to uh, we need to get two five for 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 pass u. We need to have the genes with significant adjusted p-value uh, with a look to fall change because it's what is represented there is um, the the log to fall change here um, for the differentially expressed component in this pathway. So we need to to add to give this information to pass you. Um, so what we do is we extract from the genes with significant p-value. We we uh, we add uh, we extract the gene ID and their uh, log to fall change. We need then to to say which pathway we want to display. So we can have two of them here. So we will view the pathway 10 and, and 30, 40. Um, and then we can use the pass view for, to do that. So here, just uh, because GOSEC is finished, so we have uh, 170, uh, 127 lines. So it means we have 126 uh, pathway that has been identified. And similar to, to the go terms, we have here the, the categories and then p values and etc. Yeah. Um, so then you can inspect them, uh, inspect also the cake pathway here with the differentially expressed genes. Okay. But now what we want to, to do is to, to create this uh, pass view here. So, we need to first create this file with the gene um, IDs and the fall change for the significant p-value. So we need to um, we need to cut here, cut column. We want C3 and C1 and C3. It's limited by a tab. Um, we want to do on significant p-value and absolute fall change, and I think that was a uh, nope. Here yeah, only just this one significant p-value, and then it will create that. Um, what we want to do is to rename it here afterwards. Um, here to be to be faster, so because pass view can take some time, so we will just run it. So you could do it 
uh, create a new tabular file with the gene ID that you want to display. But here for being faster, we will just run it quickly on one, only one pathway now. So what you can do is uh, search for pass view here. Uh, so you need to have, we want to display only one and we, we want to display the cake pathway. Here is the one, this one. So we would like to view this one. A uh, species used was Drosophila uh, TM6. Oops. Oh, sorry, it's fly that we need to put here. So fly. Um, we have a gene data file. It's been a while that you didn't use this gene file, so we want to use gene significant. Does this file as an header? And uh, no. The it says ensemble gene ID. Um, do we have a compute output? We want to cake native plot on the same layer layer yes and then pathway will uh, create this file similar so it will create one file per per, per pathway with a plot similar to that here so Pass view is already done, so it's now done. So you can, if you open the generated file, so you will have a representation of, of your of your pathway this way, where you have the different component of your pathway, and for the differentially expressed genes, uh, the log to fall change display uh, there with this um, this range of colors there. So it's a good way to represent an uh, interesting pathway, but you need to do it one by one here, or by creating a file, but it will generate one file per pathway. Um, on that, so uh, I think we covered, so in these tutorials we took real RNA-seq data, and what we did, we did several steps for this data set, so we we did a quality control, we did a mapping, we did uh, some estimation of the strength that is useful for counting. Um, we did then a differentially expression analysis um, with DSEC2, where we took all our seven samples, because the first steps we did it only on two samples. Um, and then out of these differentially expressed genes, we could extract some, um, we could annotate them, we could visualize them using some heat map with the that score we computed. And we did then a functional arrangement analysis uh, for extracting the Go term, the cake pathway, and visualize them using pass view. So we hope that this, um, so the, all the approach that we run during these tutorials are, can be summarized by this uh, schema there. Um, and it's a somehow a standard approach that you can use for any RNA-seq data then. So I recommend you to, to do it one step by step the first time on your own data. Um, if you want more information about the different tools, we put the reference there. Um, you can have a look uh, to useful ref uh, literature there, um, all from all the tools that we use there. Uh, we will rec ask you to fill this form there at the end of the tutorial that is embedded there that uh, tell us, um, did you like these tutorials, how, how we could improve it um, or not. And if you use it in one another, uh, if you use this tutorial on your own and you please want to, to cite it, you can use the detail that is given there. And on that, we would like to first congratulation on successfully uh, run all tutorials. Um, here we listed some tutorials that you can follow afterwards to get more information about, uh, um, about RNA-seq analysis. Uh, and thanks a lot for following these tutorials, this long tutorial. <laughs>